Greetings. My name is Jim Ramsey, and I am the director of the Stoughton Public Library. The lecture you're about to see was originally scheduled to take place at the Stoughton Public Library, but of course, owing to the ongoing global pandemic, we've been forced to adapt uh, to new circumstances, and uh, the Stoughton Public Library is excited to be bringing you this lecture, courtesy of WSTO Studios in downtown Stoughton. This lecture is brought to you by the Stoughton Public Library and Badger Talks, formerly known as UW-Madison Speakers Bureau. Badger Talks is a true embodiment of the Wisconsin idea in that their goal is to bring the UW to every corner of the state. Until it is safe to gather in person once more, Badger Talks are offering a series of lectures called Badger Talks Live. You can find out more about these and other events at badgertalks.wisc.edu. Today's talk will provide a political scientist view of the 2020 election. This presentation will illuminate the ways that the current campaign reflects and deviates from previous election cycles and what factors are likely to drive the results in Wisconsin as well as across the country. Our guest today, Barry Burden, is Professor of Political Science, Director of the Elections Research Center, and the Lyons Family Chair in Electoral Politics at UW-Madison. His research and teaching focuses on U.S. elections, public opinion, representation, and the U.S. Congress. His recent research has centered on aspects of election administration and voter participation. He has testified as an expert witness in several election law cases around the country, and he is the author of Personal Roots of Representation, co-editor with Charles Stewart of The Measure of American Elections. He has also published articles in journals such as the American Political Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, the British Journal of Political Science, Public Opinion Quarterly, and many other journals. We at the Stoughton Public Library hope you enjoy this talk by political science professor Barry Burden. Stay safe, stay well, and we hope to see you all again very soon. Well, hello, and thanks for having me. Thanks to the Stoughton Public Library for inviting me in and to all of you for uh, tuning in wherever you are, whenever uh, you happen to get to this recording. We are here in late July having a look at the presidential election. Uh, from a Wisconsin vantage point, but also from a national vantage point, I'm gonna bring to you the look at the election the way a political scientist would, uh, with the emphasis on scientists. You're going to see a lot of data some tables and figures uh, that people like me would use to try to understand what's happening in the election and put 2020 in a broader context to draw on patterns that we understand affect elections more generally. So with that, let's have a look at the, the initial slide. This is the main race. This is the marquee race between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, as we stand here today, uh, Biden is on the cusp of announcing a running mate. He's poised to do that in early August. We know that uh, Trump will be running with Mike Pence again, and both party conventions will be happening over the next month. Before the pandemic hit, uh, we thought we knew that some aspects of this election would be unusual. There would be, if nothing else, a president on the ballot who was impeached by the U.S. House of Representatives, although acquitted by the U.S. Senate. That's not something that's ever happened in American history. And a president running for re-election who narrowly won, uh, at least in the Electoral College, in 2016 and would have some challenges trying to reassemble that coalition to win again in 2020. Uh, we also knew that the two candidates would be the oldest candidates ever to run for office and Biden uh, the oldest individual ever to run. Uh, so those were likely to be the unusual factors behind the scenes, along with concerns about misinformation, about meddling by Russian actors and others. But most of those things have been supplanted by the pandemic, the economic uh, retraction that's been accompanied, that's accompanied it, and then the protests over uh, police brutality and racial inequality. So it has become a different race than we would have expected, and I'm going to try to make sense of those uh, less expected factors as well as the things we knew were coming. So let's have a look at factors we would expect to influence 2020. And I'm going to put these factors into two piles. The first pile are things that, as political scientists or as a historian, are, would be well understood. These are regularities that we see from one election to the next that should come into play in 2020, as they do in other years. 
But then there's the second bin of things about which we're much more uncertain because they are new and entirely unprecedented. There has been nothing like this pandemic affecting a presidential election ever. You think about the great calamities that have faced the United States, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the Great Depression, maybe the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. None of those were just at, at the beginning of a presidential election year and as dominating as uh, this issue has been. So in the category of things well understood, there are some historical patterns that govern elections that you may not have noticed, but tend to be sort of predictable factors that drive results. We're going to walk through some of those. Also well understood is that Trump's victory in 2020, if it happens, is likely to build upon or mimic the way he won four years ago in 2016. So we need to understand that 2016 election and and see to what degree the 2020 results are likely to mirror it or, or grow from it. But then in the right column, you'll see there's a whole list of things about which I'm going to have less to say or I'm going to be more speculative. Uh, one is how Trump's handling of the pandemic, or maybe governors' handling of the pandemic in their states, is affecting the way voters are thinking about the election. Next, and related to that, is a very unusual economic situation that is resulting in a massive contraction of the economy serious downturns with people out of work, businesses closing, uh, unemployment rates at uh, remarkable highs, uh, all due to the pandemic and the responses to it by the government and by business. Uh, hard to judge where that fits given its unusualness. And then finally, I'll try to say something about the protests that have happened in the wake of George Floyd's murder uh, back in May and how especially evaluation of Trump's uh, handling of that have affected the election. Again, these are all sort of moving parts that are a little harder to nail down and uh, which don't have quite the same historical precedent. So why don't we start with the things we do understand, these historical patterns that I think are part of the underlayment for having a look at 2020. The first historical pattern to understand is that Trump is an incumbent seeking re-election. And presidential incumbents have a very good track record at winning a second term. Since the beginning of the Republic, as you see in this table, these are all elections where a president was running for re-election. The sitting president won about two-thirds of the time. It's actually 79% of the time, 22 out of the 32 elections listed here. So we would give the benefit of the doubt to the incumbent. And it's not surprising. The incumbent has a lot of advantages from the office they hold. They obviously have the attention of the media at all times. Uh, Trump very much has that in 2020 with Joe Biden being uh, I think l less of a presence in the media. You have to go back to, uh, to 1992 to find a president who lost re-election. Uh, that was George H.W. Bush to Bill Clinton. Before that, we go back to 1980 and then to 1976, both of which were a bit unusual elections happening in the wake of Watergate. Aside from those three, it's not since the Great Depression that a sitting president, then Herbert Hoover, lost re-election because of the terrible economic situation people were facing. So there just aren't many cases. There are only 10 of them there in the right-hand column. And the question is whether Trump is likely to add to them and be on the bad side of history in terms of the patterns we've seen in the past. But setting aside all the other factors that we know will be important, the expectation or the default would be the president wins office again. That's how it operates. When parties tend to be kicked out of the White House is after they've served for two terms. So after eight years in office, a party has a very difficult time winning re-election. That's actually what we saw back in 2016. Barack Obama, a Democrat, had been in office for eight years. Hillary Clinton, a Democrat, was hoping to succeed him and extend the Democratic uh, term for four more years, and she was narrowly defeated. That's a much more common pattern. Whether Trump can uh, maintain the historical pattern and benefit from it, I think, is really unclear. So there's, there's one bit of historical trivia to keep in mind. Incumbents have the benefit of the doubt, and all else equal should be winning. The other thing to uh, look at and take account of is the nature of Trump's victory four years ago in 2016. This is the familiar Electoral College math you will have seen. Uh, you will remember the way the Electoral College works. There are 538 electors. Each state gets uh, two electors for its two U.S. senators, plus the number of members of Congress or congressional seats it has. So a state like Wisconsin has eight congressional districts plus two U.S. senators. That's 10 electors. You add all of those up, plus the three for the District of Columbia. That's 538 electors. A, a ticket of a presidential and vice presidential running mate needs to win a majority of those electors to win the White House, or 270. 
The popular vote is interesting. We poll about it a lot. I'm going to talk about it shortly. It doesn't determine who wins the election. It's the Electoral College vote. In 2016, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote nationwide over Donald Trump by a couple of million votes. You can see that in the small text at the top. But the important outcome was the Electoral College vote, where Trump won, uh, in particular by picking up those six states that are colored with the red and black hashing. Those are states that flipped from blue to red between Obama's election in 2012 to Trump's election in 2016. Those six states are familiar because most of them are in the Midwest. Our own Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania get a lot of attention. In those three states, Trump won by a total of about 77,000 votes across the three states added together. So very narrow margins, less than a percentage point in each of them, plus Iowa, Ohio, and Florida. For the Democrats to win the White House, they need to flip back some number of those states. They could do it by winning these three upper Midwest states of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, or a combination of Florida and a couple other states. There are a few routes for them. Trump needs to hold everything you see there in red, both the states that are consistently red across the two elections, but all the, also the six that have flipped. So there's not much room for error on, on Trump's part. Again, the, the popular vote is a different matter, and we're now seeing in recent years more of a divergence between the popular vote and the Electoral College vote, but it is the Electoral College vote in the end that matters. So what's the likelihood that Trump is able to recreate this map? To what degree are his voters from four years ago likely to stick with him in 2020 and to show up, not just to support him, but to show up and vote for him over Joe Biden? Well, the evidence right now indicates that he's in some trouble. His campaign is in jeopardy and uh, has been flailing a little bit in the last couple weeks to figure out what its message is and how to bring back its voters or maybe win over additional voters. I'm going to show you different pieces of evidence to that point as we go along. One piece of evidence is just looking at the polling of current uh, Americans, asking them how they're likely to behave in 2020, and then relate that back to their vote choices in 2016. So what you see on the screen is what's called a river plot. It traces the votes of people or the non-votes of people back in 2016. That's on the left-hand side. And then you follow the rivers over to the right and see how they're, at least today, in late July, indicating that they will vote in the November general election. Now, it's not surprising that most of the people who voted for Clinton in 2016 are trailing right over and voting for Biden in 2020. Most of Trump's voters will be with him. But it's the other voters that are interesting, the ones that peel off and change their decisions from one to the other. Uh, a very small share of Clinton's voters indicate that they are going to Trump. It's about 2% of her voters. You can see that very slim uh, rivulet sort of tracing down from Clinton over to Trump. But a larger number of Trump's voters are peeling away from him. It's about 6% in this figure, so about three times as many going to Biden. So with, with that imbalance alone, you get Biden on top of Trump in most national polls. But then down below, you'll see that voters who chose either a third party, a minor party candidate, or didn't vote in 2016 are disproportionately supporting Biden at this time. Right? That's the, the path leading up from the lower left to the upper right. So just tracing the preferences of voters across these four years suggests that Trump is in some trouble because he's losing more of his supporters than the Democrats are, and the Democrats are gaining more from other quarters than Trump is. The other way to look at the changes over time is to look at particular demographic groups that were in one or another partisan camp back in 2016. So here again are surveys looking at voters from about this time in 2016 to uh, surveys just done in the last couple of weeks in 2020 for voters in different demographic groups to see what kinds of shifts are happening. And you'll see that for many groups there's not a lot of change. This is the typical pattern in American politics. Group identities tend to be pretty stable, and voters tend to be consistent in their choices over time. So for example, a group that's gotten a lot of attention in the Trump era are white voters without college degrees. They're right in the middle at the top of that figure. You'll see they supported Trump over Clinton by um, a margin of about 20 points or so in 2016. It's narrowed a little bit in 2020. They're not quite as enthusiastic about uh, Trump as they were four years ago, but the margin is similar. Uh, but there are other groups that have moved in a more dramatic fashion, and I think the two to note are on the upper left, whites with college degrees. These are college-educated white voters. They were marginally on Clinton's side four years ago. Today, they are much more strongly voting Democratic. 
So they have moved away from the Republican Party. Uh, that's a bad sign, and it's why Trump and Republicans are hurting in the suburbs, in part, because that's where many white college voters are concentrated. The other group that's more surprising is down on the lower right-hand side. These are older voters, people who are 65 plus, our senior citizens. They were Trump voters four years ago. Not by a large margin, but uh, significantly so, and they helped contribute to his margin. They have reversed course. They are the most dramatic in terms of groups moving from one election to the next. Uh, they are more supportive of the Democrat, of Joe Biden, than the next age group down, the people who are in their 40s and 50s. Uh, that has been a surprise. Uh, it is hurting Trump in states like Florida, where there are a lot of elderly voters. It appears to be partly a response to his handling of the COVID pandemic, but not entirely. So we don't have a full explanation for it. But it is putting Trump in trouble. It will put him in trouble even in a state like Wisconsin, where there are a lot of older voters. We have an older electorate in Wisconsin than the national average. So there are, there are some signs of worry here for Trump. Now, a question that naturally arises in this context is, well, why are we trusting the polls? Weren't they wrong about so many things four years ago? Shouldn't we take all of this with a grain of salt or maybe not trust them at all? Well, uh, there were definitely problems with the polls in 2016, but I want to suggest that they have been rectified and that the pattern is much clearer now for a variety of reasons. So let me take you back to 2016, remind you what the polls looked like as we were heading toward Election Day, and there are two levels to think about here. There are national surveys that ask the whole American electorate who they're likely to vote for. Again, this is a, just a kind of a beauty contest. It doesn't determine who wins. That's the Electoral College, but it's a guide as to where the electorate is leaning. And then there are state-by-state -state polls where a media outlet or a university will go in and only survey people in Michigan or Pennsylvania or some other state. Now, in 2016, one of the curious things that I think we recognized afterwards is that the national polls and the state polls were telling different stories. You'll see in the upper left, these are the national polls. It's, it's all the surveys that were done during the general election averaged together. And you'll see there's a lot of volatility. Uh, there were time, most of the time, Clinton is ahead of Trump. That's the blue line on top compared to the red line below. But there are times when Trump closes the gap or maybe even is slightly ahead of Clinton. But there's a lot of zigging and zagging over the course of the campaign. By the end of the campaign, the polls had it just right. In, in this figure, uh, the average poll has Clinton ahead by about three percentage points. She won by about two percentage points. That's within the margin of error. It's actually more accurate than the polls were in 2012. So the national polls were not off at all. The problem happens in the states. So what you see below is the same figure, but just for surveys that were done in Wisconsin. It's a very different picture. One is there's not a lot of zigging and zagging. It's very stable. Clinton appears to be ahead of Trump throughout the campaign. And by the end of the campaign, she's leading by six or seven points, according to just about every survey that was done in Wisconsin. Trump was not ahead in a single one of them. He, of course, won the state very narrowly. So the polls were off by about six or seven points. So what we had in 2016, in retrospect, was a mismatch between the national polls, which were suggesting a small Clinton lead, and the state polls, which were suggesting big leads in a lot of swing states. And that just doesn't make sense because we know that Wisconsin is kind of a bellwether or a barometer for the country. Wisconsin is typically within one or two points of the national vote, so there shouldn't be a disparity this large. In the end, it turned out to be the state polls that were off for a variety of reasons uh, rather than the national polls. But that should have been a warning sign. The pattern in 2020 is very different. We're not at the end of the campaign, but to this point, the national polls, which are up top, and the, and the Wisconsin poll, which is the one I pulled out below, are mostly in alignment. At the national level, uh, Biden has been ahead of Trump throughout. The zigging and zagging we saw in 2016 doesn't exist in 2020. These are rock solid surveys, very consistent, very steady lead for Joe Biden from about March or April when the Democratic nomination was wrapped up. And it's accelerated since then as Trump has gotten into more difficult times after the pandemic took hold. So that's been very consistent. And I think the steadiest polls we've seen in just about any presidential campaign that I can remember. And then below, you see the Wisconsin polls. Now, there is a bit of a, a funny a connection there. Right in the middle, there's a place where it looks like the two lines cross. I think that's really the result of one or two aberrant surveys. Set that aside or ignore that for the moment. And you'll see that for most of this time period, Biden is also ahead of Trump in Wisconsin by a similar margin. 
by late July where we are today, Biden is ahead by six or seven points. That's right in line with the national polls. So the disparity or the contradiction we saw in 2016 is not apparent in 2020 in the same way. And I think that makes anyone who does polling, people like me, more confident that the patterns we're seeing are meaningful because they are at least in harmony from the national level to the state level. OK, so that's the broad picture about polling and these kind of historical patterns that tell us what's likely to happen. The polling today, I think, is very indicative that Trump is in real trouble. Despite the advantage that incumbents typically have, there are enough headwinds against him that it's going to be a challenging, uh, if not close to impossible, task to pull off a victory in the popular vote. Um, Maybe somewhat easier in the Electoral College, but still very challenging. So let me show you the other barometer that we use as a historical gauge of where presidents stand. And that is the question of whether the public approves or disapproves of the job the president is doing in his job. This is a very standard question. It's been asked since about the 1930s or 1940s. It's kind of the Dow Jones Industrial Index for uh, presidents. It's a judgment of whether the public's with them or against them. So let me show you the trend in presidential approval ratings for Donald Trump over his four, three and a half years in office. Uh, the orange line are those who disapprove, and the green line is those who approve. So there are a couple things to note about this. Uh, this figure from the website 538 shows that, first of all, for all of Trump's presidency, more Americans have disapproved of his performance than approved of it. He has been underwater entirely. There was no honeymoon. It went very quickly to this picture and has been extremely steady. These are the steadiest approval ratings of any president who has ever been asked about in surveys. You might think that the Trump years have been tumultuous. After all, there's been a a pandemic and uh, government shutdown and uh, an impeachment. Uh, But for all of that, the public has been very stable in its view that they are generally down on Trump. Uh, Now, there are times when he's doing better, and you'll see a little of that happens just about in late March or early April, right when the pandemic takes hold and people begin to be aware of COVID-19, the government, uh, universities, businesses begin to shut down. Uh, There's a bit of a rallying effect where people come to Trump's side, as often happens in a time of crisis. And so the green line bumps up a little bit, the orange line bumps down a little bit, but that doesn't last long. And very quickly, the public begins to sour on Trump's performance and his approval rating has fallen since then. Today, he's at about 40%. That's not a good mark for a president who wants to win re-election. He does not need to win a majority of the vote. He needs to win a majority of the Electoral College. But it's very difficult to win individual states if your approval rating is at 40%. With only two serious candidates in the race, and I think a very small presence for minor parties and independents this year, Trump will need to get close to or over 50% in each of those states to win. That was not the case four years ago. Why do we care about presidential approval ratings in the context of an election? It's because knowing where a president stands with the public's approval rating is a very good indicator of the vote he will earn on election day. So let me show you that historical pattern. So now we're digging a little deeper into the data. Uh, I'm going to show you this scatter plot, which shows along the bottom the president's approval rating just as they're going into election day. So these are all presidents seeking re-election from the 1950s until uh, Obama's re-election in 2012. Along the vertical axis, you see the share of the vote that the incumbent party won. So higher values are better. And above 50 means they want a majority of the vote. There's a very tight relationship between these two things. Presidents who have higher approval ratings also do better on election day. Uh, You can see Obama's rating there uh, in 2012. He was the last president re-elected just below 50%. He was in the high 40s, so somewhat better than Trump. And he managed better than 50% of the vote, if you trace over to the vertical axis. So presidents do tend to outperform their approval ratings a little bit. We wouldn't expect Trump to only get 40% of the vote because he only has 40% approval. He's likely to be higher than that. But if you find 40% on on the horizontal axis there and trace upward, you'll see that it doesn't get him to 50%. That uh, diagonal line crosses through about the upper 40s, and it puts him in the territory where presidents tend to lose. You'll see that the only elections down in that range of the graph are 1980, which was Jimmy Carter's loss when he was defeated by Ronald Reagan, and 1988 when George H.W. Bush was, uh, I'm sorry, yes, 1988, uh, George W. Bush managed managed to win, uh, 
But those are the kind of exceptions down at that end of the scale. So Trump is in dangerous territory. He's in league with presidents who have been defeated in prior elections. Uh, 2016, by the way, falls right about on this line. Hillary Clinton was not an incumbent, but she did represent the Democratic administration in a number of ways. Uh, Obama's rating was in the upper 40s, close to 50, and she managed right about 50% of the, a little bit better than 50% of the two-party vote, so pretty close. So even as exceptional as people think 2016 was, it does follow this pattern, and I would expect 2020 to follow this pattern as well. Now, there is one thing that's a little bit different this year. Uh, each election is a little bit different. The overall approval rating, I think, will trend with election results pretty closely. But one thing that has emerged uh, really before Trump came to office but has accelerated since then is that there's an imbalance between the people who approve of his performance and those who disapprove. The people who dislike Trump dislike him much more than the people who like him. There's a real asymmetry there. And I'll just show you one piece of evidence on this. This is from a, a poll done just in the last few weeks nationwide survey that asked people not just whether they approve or disapprove of Trump's performance, but whether their approval is strong or somewhat, and whether they have a strong or somewhat disapproval rating. And you'll see that if you add together the first two approval categories, he's at about 42 percent. It's very close to the figure we just saw. His disapproval is at about 53, very close to the figure we just saw. But the largest group there, 41 percent, are people who strongly disapprove of his performance. So these are Democrats and progressives and people who are unhappy with the state of the country who are going to be very motivated to show up in 2016 to turn the incumbent out. It is the in 2020 to turn out the incumbent who won in 2016. He is the person on the ballot. This is primarily a referendum on the sitting president. And so scores like these with a real imbalance, 40 plus percent strongly disapproving, but only 21 percent strongly approving. Uh, he just doesn't have enough voters who are enthusiastically in his corner to counter the number of voters who are angry or displeased and are going to take it out on him by voting against him uh, rather than so much voting for Joe Biden. So we have a very strong connection between presidential approval ratings and election outcomes. As you might expect, the historical pattern also shows a very strong connection between the state of the economy and presidential reelection. Presidents who are fortunate enough to preside over good economies, uh, say Bill Clinton in 1996, are rewarded with big victories. And presidents who preside over economies that are heading downward or contracting or perceived to be failing, someone like Jimmy Carter in 1980, tend to be defeated. So let me show you the evidence on that, and then we'll think about where Donald Trump fits into the pattern. So this is one measure of economic performance. We might use others. But what you've got scaled along the bottom of this figure is the growth in GDP, so the gross domestic product, the size of the economy. When this is growing, we would say it's boom times. When it's negative or shrinking, we're in recession most often. Right? So positive values are good. And most of these elections you'll see are to the right of zero. We have positive growth in most election years. And along the vertical axis, it's the same thing you saw before. This is the share of the vote that the incumbent party wins. There is certainly a connection. Presidents who are presiding over better times tend to do better. You'll see an election like 2012 is right there in the middle. Obama's got an economy that's chugging along at a slow but positive pace, and he wins uh, just over 50% of the vote. Uh, you see also George Bush back in 2004 had a somewhat stronger economy. He was reelected uh, by a fair margin. There aren't many elections down on the negative side of this figure. The only one that shows up here is 1980, which was Carter's loss in bad economic times. Now, where does Donald Trump's economy show up on this figure? I don't think it does because the retraction of the economy is so dramatic, it's literally off the scale of this figure. We're about to get new uh, estimates of gross domestic product in the second quarter. We have yet the third quarter to go, which will happen before Election Day. Uh, these are large negative numbers. People are talking about large, you know, double-digit uh, declines in GDP. Now, it may be that growth is improving between the first quarter and the third quarter, and there may be a story for Trump to tell about him helping the economy climb out of the basement it was in in May and June and July. But for the moment, it seems impossible that a president could win re-election with uh, the kind of growth we've seen. Now, so that's a historic pattern. Good economic times tend to relate to good performance. It's not perfect, as you saw in the figure. And this year may be different. It may be that voters give Trump something of a pass. They don't blame him fully for the bad economy. 
They may put it on the pandemic, and they may put the pandemic on a, some other actor, whether it's China or the CDC or other health authorities or businesses or whomever. So he's only partly to blame in the public's eyes. Um, but even so, I think even with that amount of discounting, the economy is going to be in a very difficult position for Trump or anyone who, who is in this position to win re-election. There's one other caveat to the economic story, and that is that it looks like over time the economy has come to affect elections less than it used to. It used to be there's a very strong connection. People punished or rewarded the person in office depending on how the economy was doing. But in recent years, partisanship has become so strong. Democrats are very consistently voting for Democratic candidates, Republicans the same for their candidates, that not many people are swayed by the economy. It rises and falls, but people are still sort of dialed into the candidates they preferred. Let me show you, just show you one piece of evidence on that. This is going to be the most complicated figure you see. The point to take away from it is that the relationship between the economy and evaluations of the president has, has faded over time. So let me explain quickly what's happening, and then I'll just show you what's going on in recent years. So along the bottom is, the measure, is a measure of public confidence in the economy. This is consumer confidence, a statistic you may have heard about based on surveys asking people what they think of the economy. So higher values are better. People feel good about the economy. Along the vertical axis is presidential approval. We have already seen presidential approval ratings, and we know they're strongly connected to the vote. For all of these presidents, and almost all of them, from Eisenhower onward, you'll see that there's a positive relationship. When people think more favorably about the economy, they tend to have higher approval ratings of the president. He becomes more likely to be reelected. Uh, you can even see that in Jimmy Carter, uh, which is in the upper right-hand side of the figure. There were times during his presidency when people were more optimistic and they liked him more. And there were plenty of times when they were more pessimistic, especially at the end, and he was punished for it. So that positive slope exists for almost all of the presidents up through George W. Bush. But beginning with Barack Obama, there is a flat line, you'll see in the lower right, no relationship. During some periods in Obama's presidency, people were very happy about the economy. Other times, they were bearish about the economy. His approval ratings didn't vary much because partisanship had dug in so tightly. They weren't, the public wasn't responding. And for Trump, the range of both of those things is very narrow. People have been mildly positive about the economy before the pandemic through most of his presidency, but his approval ratings have been stuck in the low 40s throughout. So we only have two presidents who are like this, but it does indicate that maybe there's been something of a disconnect between economic performance and evaluations of presidents and elections. So if that's the case, Trump may be able to survive some of the negative judgments about the economy if voters are looking at other things, in particular their party. Now, there is one other factor this year that doesn't exist for any of these other elections, and that's attitudes about the coronavirus and the Trump administration's handling of it, and, and maybe how Biden would handle it if he were in office next year. So let's take a quick look at that, where things stand today, realizing that things are likely to change between now and Election Day. The state of the pandemic is likely to change, but also the public's views about it are likely to evolve. Uh, these are uh, points showing uh, about survey questions asking whether people approve or disapprove of Trump's handling of the coronavirus situation. So not his overall job rating, which we saw was underwater. But here specifically, how is he handling COVID-19? You see here the small rally or blip he got in late March to early April, just as it was taking hold, and people looked to him for leadership. Uh, since then, the public has really soured on his handling of it for whatever reason. The percentages have declined, and today about 20% more of the public disapproves of his handling than approves of it. So even if voters are not looking at the economy or not basing their vote on that solely, but instead of thinking about this one issue, this dominant issue, which is uh, likely to be at the very center of the campaign, uh, Trump is in trouble there, with many more people thinking he's handling it badly than handling it well. OK, so that's, that's the backdrop. We've got approval ratings. There are historical relationships to the economy, which has been important, but may be weakening. There is an incumbent on the ballot. Incumbents tend to be more closely tied to economic performance. So why don't we now skip ahead and look at where things stand in the race. Let's have a look at the, the state of public intentions about their voting patterns in 2020, uh, given all that we know in late July. So I'm going to show you here uh, voting intentions in surveys that began uh, early this year, running up through where we are today. Simply ask people, are you likely to vote for Joe Biden or Donald Trump in the general election, if the election were held today? 
It's not held today, so this is not a prediction, simply a snapshot of where things are. But much like the uh, polls I showed you earlier, the uh, pattern here has been very steady. Joe Biden has been ahead of Trump in essentially every national poll for the last few months since the Democratic nomination finished up. Uh, his lead over Trump has widened over time. It went from four or five points back in the winter to now seven or eight or nine points, depending on the survey. It's been very steady. There are only a few pollsters that deviate from this pattern. Uh, very consistent. So it, it's difficult to see, given what people think about the economy, what they think about Trump's handling of the coronavirus, what they think about Trump's handling of his job overall, a way that Trump can climb back the seven or eight or nine points he's behind Joe Biden to be in the lead by Election Day. I think it would be exceptional and, and surprising to me if Trump were able to win the popular vote. Of course, Trump didn't win the popular vote four years ago. That's not what determines who wins the presidency. So we have to somehow translate what we're seeing here in the national polls to what's likely to happen in the Electoral College. That is a state-by-state -state election where candidates try to cobble together enough Electoral College votes to get to the 270 they need to take office. So let's have a look, what I think is a, a cool look at the way the Electoral College is organized today. What you see here is sort of a snake of states running from the most Democratic states, which are on the left-hand side of the screen, places like Hawaii and Vermont and California, the size of the circle being bigger, uh, bigger states with more population, smaller states with less, and then just tracing that from left to right so you get to the most Republican states on the right-hand side, places like Wyoming and Arkansas and West Virginia. The states at the two ends of this snake are not in doubt. California will be giving all of its electoral votes to Joe Biden, quite confident about that. A uh, place like Wyoming will be giving all of its electoral votes to Donald Trump. We're clear about that. What's interesting and important is what's happening in the middle with the states that are either toss-ups or slightly leaning to one side or the other. These are the battleground states or the swing states that you saw on that Electoral College map before. According to this analysis from the Cook Political Report, Wisconsin's right in the middle. It would be today, according to their analysis, the tipping point state. It would be the state that puts Joe Biden over the top, not Donald Trump, but by their analysis, Joe Biden over the top to 270. If Biden is also able to pick up a state like Arizona or Pennsylvania or Georgia, some places that have been a little bit out of limits for Democrats, then his victory becomes larger. It's not just 270, but maybe in the low 300s or high 300s. There are even some states that have been really out of reach for Democrats, like Texas. You see the big uh, pink circle there to the right. Texas looks like it may be in play. Uh, Ohio has been a little bit out of reach. It may be in play. Polls are indicating things are very close in those states. Now, they may revert back to the Republicans a bit by Election Day. It depends, I think, on the, mostly on the pandemic and the public health situation, the economy that's connected to it. Um, but at the moment, the Electoral College is certainly on Biden's side. But it is not as decisively or clearly leading to a Biden victory the way the popular vote is. So although I think we should be very confident that Biden will win the popular vote, in the Electoral College, he is still the, the advantage candidate, has the lead. I think it would be difficult for him to lose that at this point, but it's not impossible. There, there are more scenarios where the Trump campaign manages victory despite losing the popular vote. Now, why is that the case? Why would the popular vote in the Electoral College be out of step? Let me show you. I, I already told you I saw, you saw the most complicated graph. That may have been the second most complicated graph. This is one to spend a moment on. So these are a series of simulations done by The Economist magazine that relate the popular vote to the Electoral College vote. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship, as we've seen. There's a mismatch from time to time. It happened in 2000, happened in 2016. Along the bottom in this graph is the share of the popular vote that the Democrat gets. So higher values to the right mean the Democrat wins by more in one of these simulated elections. And the vertical axis is how many Electoral College votes the Democratic ticket should be expected to get. 270 is the dividing line. You can see it there. Now, what's interesting is that these, these simulated elections, each one of these circles being one election, doesn't run right through the 50-50 point. If there's a 50-50 tie in the popular vote, most of the time we would expect the Democrats to fall below the 270 mark. So if there's a tie in the popular vote, most of these simulations would say the Republicans are going to win the Electoral College. There is an inherent advantage for Republicans in the, in the Electoral College, in part because there are some 
swing states that tend to tilt to their side, places like Florida and Ohio, but also states like Texas and a lot of small rural states like Wyoming, Alaska, um, Montana, and others out west where Republicans tend to run up the vote by winning big margins, but in states with not very many voters. So it doesn't take a lot of people to make that happen. So it's not really until Democrats get to about 52, 53, 54 percent of the vote where we become more confident that the Democratic ticket will win the Electoral College. Remember, again, Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine four years ago won by a couple of percentage points. So they would have been in the 52 to 53 percent range. They lost the Electoral College. That's as likely as not when the Democrats are in that range. It's only going to be if the Biden ticket can push it to the mid-50s, winning 55 or 56 percent of the vote, that it becomes a near certainty that they win the Electoral College. So they're against all of the patterns we've seen, most of which are pushing against Trump's reelection, there is this sort of uh, safety net for Trump that he's able to lose the popular vote by probably a few million votes, by a couple of percentage points, and still have a good chance at winning the Electoral College. So that's the presidential race. Uh, I do want to finish the talk by having a look just briefly at the other things that are on the ballot this fall. We tend to forget about them as voters until we get very close to Election Day. But we should not forget that the entire House of Representatives is on the ballot in every even-numbered election year, so all 435 seats. And about a third of the Senate, the Senate seats are staggered, uh, will be up this year as well. Democrats currently control the House. Republicans currently control the Senate. Both chambers seem as though they could be up for grabs this year and will determine whether, along with the presidential race, one party might manage to have unified control of the federal government again. You know, come 2021. So let's have a look at these two chambers and just to have a, uh, a kind of sense of where things are likely to end up. So what's the status quo today? Uh, here's the House of Representatives. Democrats are in the majority by about, uh, what is it, 33 plus 3, about 35 to 36 seats. There are a few vacancies, but Democrats have a pretty solid majority, which they have now had for a few years. They would like to hold on to that. Uh, Republicans would need to pick up or flip about 20 seats in order to be victorious. Now, there are seats around the country that are held by Democrats where Trump won, where Republicans hope they can flip the seat because of its underlying favorability to the Republicans. An example of that would be the district of Congressman Ron Kind in the western part of our state. That's a district that Trump won, but it has a Democratic incumbent. So you can imagine Republicans will be focused on places like those, hoping to win them back. It's difficult to do that if your candidate at the top of the ticket is not faring well. We know that there are presidential coattails that tend to pervade down the ticket. So Democrats are hoping that if their candidate, Joe Biden, does well at the top of the ticket, it will help their party down ballot and help them keep the House. Now, the Senate maybe is the more interesting one. The margin there is closer. There are only 53 Republicans, 45 Democrats, plus two independents, Bernie Sanders and Angus King, who caucus with the Democrats. So it's really a 53-47 split. That means Democrats only need to flip three seats in order to win back the Senate. Now, winning back the Senate is helpful if you're the party that was in the minority, now you're in the majority. You can do things like approve nominees to the Supreme Court. But most business in the Senate is subject to the filibuster. And that takes 60 votes to stop. So having a majority in the Senate doesn't quite give you the power it has in the House. Uh, but it would allow the Democrats to do things that they're currently stopped from doing today. So uh, 17 or 18 seats in the House, three in the Senate. What's the likelihood of this happening? We do have surveys asking people how they're likely to vote in their House race. This is the so-called generic ballot question, where people are asking surveys, are you likely to vote for the Democrat or Republican running for the House seat in your district? It doesn't name them, but it simply asks who they're likely to favor. And these lines look a lot like the lines we saw in the Biden-Trump trend. There has been a steady advantage for the Democratic candidate over the Republican candidate in each district, and that has widened over time. Today, it's about a seven or eight point gap, with more people saying they would vote for the Democrat in their district than the Republican. So that might give Democrats hope. Uh, there are some concerns about this. One is that the survey doesn't talk about the candidates themselves. It just asks about a generic Democrat or Republican. And of course, the candidates and their campaigns do matter, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. The other factor is that in the US House, much like in the Electoral College, Republicans have an inherent structural advantage. Democrats winning 50% of the vote, tying the Republicans, would not likely control the House of Representatives, because there are many more seats where Republicans can win 
by small margins and build a majority. So there's been some analysis of this mismatch between the votes and the seats in the House, much the way there has been analysis of the mismatch between the popular vote and the electoral vote at the presidential level. And I'll just show you one example of that here in the lower part of the figure. Along the bottom, you have the popular vote won by the Democrats nationwide in all the House races. And then along the vertical axis, how many seats they win in the House. Remember, there are 435 seats in the House, to, so to get a majority, a party needs 218. 218 is the magic number. These lines don't cross at 50-50, just the way the Electoral College map I showed, or the plot I showed you a moment ago, also doesn't cross at 50-50. If the Democrats only tie the Republicans in the popular vote, Republicans are likely to win the House of Representatives. You can see that right in the middle of that figure. Those lines don't get the Democrats up to 218. It will take a victory of three or four percentage points, probably, for Democrats to break even in terms of seats, and probably a bigger victory of seven or eight points in order to have a firm majority in the House. That's where they are today in the polls, good for the Democrats, uh, but that has to hold and everything sort of has to come together for them to keep those seats. So there's not a guarantee either way. I think Democrats are clearly advantaged in holding their majority in the House, especially given what's happening at the top of the ticket. It's likely to help Democrats and hurt Republicans if these patterns hold. Uh, but Democrats need that to happen. They need to win by large margins in the House in order to keep that majority. I promised that the Senate was a little more interesting. This is a map of the Senate seats that are up this year. The gray states have no Senate seat up. That would include Wisconsin. The states that are marked in blue have a Democratic senator up for re-election. The states in red have a Republican senator up for re-election. So the map shows you right away, Republicans have more territory to defend. There are 23 Republicans up for re-election. They have to win all those seats back. Democrats only have to defend 12 seats. And those 12 are in pretty Democratic states, places like Michigan and, Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, Illinois, Minnesota, Oregon. Uh, they're not likely to lose really any of those. The only Democratic seat that's in real jeopardy is the one in Alabama where uh, Doug Jones won a special election against Roy Moore a couple of years ago. He's in real trouble. So that's one Democrats might lose. Remember, they need to pick up three to get to a majority. So if they lose Alabama, Democrats now need to pick up four. But look at all the places where Democrats have an opportunity. There are places like Arizona, where former astronaut Mark Kelly is in the lead over the incumbent appointed Senator Martha McSally by a pretty large margin, and where the Democrat Joe Biden might also win the state. There are other places like North Carolina, where Senator Tom Tillis is in trouble, uh, in Iowa, where Joni Ernst, the Republican, is in trouble, maybe even in Kentucky, where Mitch McConnell, the majority leader, is in trouble, certainly in Maine, where Susan Collins, who's a moderate Republican, is running against a strong candidate and is also in trouble. So Republicans need a lot of things to fall right for them to hold their Senate majority. They need to keep all the seats they have maybe pick up Alabama and not lose more than a couple of these very competitive seats where right now Democrats are ahead in the polls and are raising more money. Uh, this actually puts the Republicans on the defense and they're having to defend seats in places like South Carolina they thought were a sure thing but are now in some jeopardy. So that's a look at the Senate. I think it does give the Democrats at least the possibility that they could win the White House where Joe Biden is, has the advantage, is in the lead, and I think is unlikely to give up much ground. Keep the House where they already have a majority and simply need to hold what they have, and they're likely to do that if Biden does well at the top of the ticket. And then have some good fortune and some coattail effects in the U.S. Senate and pick up just enough seats to maybe get them to a majority. That's where we are in late July. It's going to be a long campaign. Uh, things may well change, so I do want to bracket everything we've said today. This is tied to where we are midsummer. We've got a running mate announcement yet to come from Joe Biden, two party conventions, three presidential debates, a vice presidential debate, lots of news and other developments that are likely to happen between now and, uh, and late September, October, when people begin to vote, certainly by election day, when the counting begins to be revealed, and the many days or weeks after when those ballots slowly come in and lead to a total. Uh, if you like what you've heard today and you want to keep up with this kind of analysis, I'd encourage you to follow the center I direct at the university, the Elections Research Center. We have a website where you can keep up with our publications and other events that might interest you. It's elections.wisc.edu. Uh, the center also has a Twitter account and Facebook page. If you want to follow us there, you'll get automatic updates. Uh, it won't clog up your feed too much. It's a post or two uh, every week or so, uh, but that's one way to keep up with what's happening, both in analysis of 
Wisconsin and of the nation. So thanks very much for being with me and have a great summer and election season.